Welcome to part 17 of the Ultimate Unsolved Mysteries Iceberg. In this series, we deep dive cases including true crime, mysterious disappearances, myths and legends, strange events, cryptids, internet mysteries, and more. The Disappearance of Nikki McCown. The disappearance of Nikki McCown, a 28-year-old woman from Richmond, Indiana, continues to mystify investigators. Nikki vanished under mysterious circumstances on July 22, 2001, just weeks before her scheduled wedding. On that day, after attending church with her daughter and fiancé, she went to a local laundromat to wash her clothes. Despite returning once to drop off her daughter and heading back to the laundromat, she was never seen again. Nikki McCown was a corrections officer at a local prison and a devoted mother to her nine-year-old daughter, Peyton. She was eagerly preparing for her new life with her fiance, Bobby Webster, a high school sweetheart with whom she had rekindled a relationship. However, her sudden disappearance left her family and friends in a state of shock and despair. The initial investigation into Nikki's disappearance explored multiple leads, including her relationship with her fiance and a mysterious encounter at the laundromat where she was last seen. According to reports, Nikki had complained about being harassed by some men at the laundromat. Although this lead was investigated, it did not result in any significant breakthrough in the case. Suspicion initially fell on her fiance, Bobby Webster, especially after his actions following Nikki's disappearance raised eyebrows. He was reported to have attempted to return the engagement ring for a refund and canceled the wedding venue, actions that many found suspicious. However, he was eventually ruled out by the authorities. Bobby Webster explained that he took these actions so he could fund the campaign to increase awareness of Nikki's case. Personally, I'm surprised that so many people saw these actions as suspicious, and to me this seems like the actions of a devoted fiancé. The case took a significant turn when, in November 2001, Nikki's vehicle was found in Dayton, Ohio, at an apartment complex where she had previously resided with an ex-boyfriend. Although the vehicle contained her folded laundry, there was no trace of Nikki herself, and the car offered no forensic evidence to advance the investigation. Her ex-boyfriend, who lived at the complex and had an alibi, was also cleared of suspicion. Police suspected that the person who left the car there did so because he knew that the ex-boyfriend resided in the area. The investigation later focused on Tommy Swint, a co-worker of Nikki's at the prison. Swint later went on to become a police officer in 2007, but only served in this capacity for two months. Swint suddenly resigned from the police department upon being revealed as a person of interest in Nikki's case adding to the suspicion placed on him. In February 2010, police moved on Swint to arrest him for the slaying of a paid companionship worker in 1991. Swint apparently decided that the possibility of life in prison for a former prison guard and cop was not appealing, and decided to impose the death penalty on himself during the arrest attempt. Unfortunately, by doing so, he denied the police the ability to further question him in relation to Nikki's disappearance. Peyton, Nikki's daughter, is now grown up and continues to search for answers in her mother's disappearance. She's given a load of interviews about the case and is a great advocate for her mom's case and other missing people as well. It's very heartening to see someone affected by such a tragedy remain strong and act so courageously. If you have any information with respect to the Nikki McCown case, please contact the Richmond Police Department with details. The disappearance of Ralph Hendry and Kathy Brandle. The disappearance of Ralph Hendry and Kathy Brandle has sparked widespread attention and concern. The couple, seasoned sailors, were enjoying a winter cruising adventure in the Caribbean when they vanished. Their last known location was near Grand Anse Beach in Grenada, on February 18th, 2024. Ralph and Kathy, both experienced sailors, had been living on their yacht for over a decade, embracing the sea as their home. 
They were participating in a leisurely cruise through the Eastern Caribbean after completing a significant sailing event from Virginia to Antigua. Their yacht, SV Simplicity, was later found abandoned and in disarray 80 miles from the original location, hinting at a sudden and alarming incident. Further cementing extreme concerns, evidence on the yacht included bloodstains. The timing of their disappearance coincided with a prison break in Grenada, leading authorities to speculate about and then confirm a possible connection. Three prisoners identified as Trayvon Robertson, Abita Stanislaus, and Ron Mitchell escaped and fled using the yacht. The three escapees were later recaptured and extensively interrogated about their involvement. The Grenadian police chief initially stated on February 21st, 2024, that the couple had been, quote, disposed of by the criminals. However, a later clarification on February 26th, 2024, indicates a possibility of survival. That said, hope is fading daily, and American news outlets are generally reporting now that American authorities believe the couple to be slain. Per the latest news on February 27, 2024, the St. Vincent Coast Guard continues their search efforts for the couple, even though they're presumed slain. That said, at present, the search continues, and there is an extremely slim chance that they may still be alive. I'll have an update on this case in a later entry in this series, Once More is Known. The Connecticut River Valley Killer. The Connecticut River Valley case revolves around a series of tragic events that took place from the late 1970s through the 1980s along the border of New Hampshire and Vermont. The perpetrator, known as the Connecticut River Valley Killer, or simply the Valley Killer, is linked to multiple incidents where women were targeted and slain. One notable incident involved Eva Marie Morse, a single mother last seen hitchhiking in Charlestown, New Hampshire in 1985. Her remains were later discovered near Unity, New Hampshire. The case of Linda Moore presents another horrifying scenario. She was attacked in her home in Saxton's River, Vermont in 1986. Witnesses provided a description leading to a composite sketch of a suspect, but no arrests were made. Another victim, Barbara Agnew, disappeared after a skiing outing and was found months later in a state that indicated a violent struggle. On the night of August 6, 1988, 22-year-old Jane Borowski, who was pregnant, survived a brutal attack after stopping at a closed convenience store in West Swansea, New Hampshire. After being approached and forcibly removed from her car by a man who falsely accused her of harming his girlfriend, Borowski was stabbed a total of 27 times. Despite severe injuries, including a severed jugular vein, collapsed lungs, and lacerations, she managed to drive for help and later provided crucial details for the investigation including a composite sketch of her attacker. Remarkably, despite this heinous and cowardly attack, her unborn daughter miraculously survived. Borowski remains the sole survivor of the assailant's known attacks. The serial killer, apparently spooked by Borowski's survival, is not known to have struck again. Investigations have explored various theories and suspects. Michael Nicolaou, has attracted significant attention due to his violent history and connections to the areas where the incidents occurred. The similarities between Nicolau's known actions and the circumstances of the attacks have led some to consider him a prime suspect, although conclusive evidence remains elusive. However, in 2005, Michael, the lead suspect, slew his wife before rendering himself formerly living by his own hand. Unfortunately, I don't imagine that this case will ever be formally solved. But on the bright side, I don't think this killer poses any additional threat. Hey everyone, it's Jimmy, the creator behind the Lazy Chill Zone channel. If you're enjoying my content, please hit the like and subscribe buttons and the notification bell. 
As I've said before, my goal is to create the most expansive iceberg series in YouTube history, and I want you all along for the ride. Also, consider signing up for a YouTube membership, joining the Patreon, and joining the Discord. In particular, joining on for a YouTube membership or joining the Patreon helps me spend more time devoted to this channel. Also, check out the merch store and pick something cool up while also supporting the channel. The Disappearance of Peter Dimitrov This story, which has received virtually no attention in the English-speaking world, was brought to my notice by Bulgarian subscriber Georgi Stykov. Unfortunately, there are very few sources on this in English, and automatic translation from Bulgarian is horrid. However, given that Dimitrov may be missing in the U.S., I feel that it's necessary to cover this case regardless. Peter Dimitrov visited the U.S. Embassy in Sofia for a visa interview as part of his plans to participate in a work and travel program in the United States. However, his visa application was denied. He was expected to meet friends outside the embassy, but he never arrived. His phone has been inactive since that day. Surveillance footage confirmed Peter's entry into the embassy, yet there is no evidence of him leaving the premises. Given the lack of sources, it is unclear to me how thorough the surveillance is at the U.S. Embassy in Sofia. However, I would assume it to be quite fulsome given that it's a U.S. Embassy. My understanding, admittedly through translated sources, is that some believe that he ended himself immediately after the denial. A body was found nearby, which the authorities initially assumed to be Peter's, putting investigations on hold during the crucial phase after his disappearance. However, subsequent DNA testing confirmed that this was not Peter's body. Another theory is that Peter may have illegally immigrated to the United States. However, I was able to locate an interview with Peter's father, Vladimir, circa 2010, who was adamant that this could not be the case, though his reasoning for this was not sound. Vladimir said that his son could not afford it. However, he clearly had enough to at least afford a plane ticket. And circa 2010, Peter could have easily met a Bulgarian connection in the U.S. online. At any rate, Peter Dimitrov's case remains a complete mystery at this time. If Peter is still alive, it would appear that he is likely living somewhere in Europe or the United States. The Death Dealer of Kaunas The Lytukis Garage Massacre, part of the wider Kaunas pogrom, represents just one chapter of the Holocaust. On June 27, 1941, in Kaunas, Lithuania, a horrific act was committed against the Jewish population. As the Wehrmacht advanced, they were followed by SS killing squads, tasked primarily with eliminating the local Jewish population. In this climate of terror, local Lithuanian nationalists, emboldened by the Nazi presence, perpetrated a truly brutal massacre. Over 50 Jewish individuals were tortured and slain in a spectacle of violence that was both public and profoundly shocking. The crowd of onlookers, which included women and children, cheered as each individual was mercilessly beaten to death with a crowbar by a figure infamously known as the Death Dealer of Kaunas. This sinister figure, amidst the slaughter, at one point paused to play the Lithuanian national anthem on an accordion while standing on top of the pile of corpses of Jewish men he had just slain. The identity of the Death Dealer remains shrouded in mystery and controversy. Despite various theories, no conclusive evidence has solidified the true identity of this individual. Some speculate that he was a local nationalist, released from prison by the advancing German forces, who took a leading role in the violence. This theory aligns with the known facts that the Einsatzgruppen encouraged local populations to participate in the pogroms, effectively mobilizing anti-Semitic sentiments among the local populace. Another theory states that his family was slain by the withdrawing Soviet forces, leading to his apparent justification of the mass slayings. Another theory suggests that the individual in the picture is Joachim Heyman, a German SS officer, and that he was the death dealer of Kaunas. 
However, based on multiple eyewitness testimonies confirming the details of the events, including the testimony of the photographer, this theory has been discredited. Yet another theory suggests that there may have been nothing in particularly anti-Semitic about the man, that he perhaps just enjoyed being given the freedom to kill people without consequence or perhaps not even without consequence, but while being lauded as a hero by the locals for doing so. At this point, it appears unlikely that the identity of the death dealer of Kaunas will ever be known definitively. Phantom Kangaroos. Phantom Kangaroos represent sightings of kangaroos or kangaroo-like creatures in regions where they are not native and where no zoological evidence can validate their existence. These sightings, often described in detail, have been reported across various parts of the world, including the United States, the United Kingdom, France, and Japan. In the United States, the history of phantom kangaroo sightings dates back to the late 19th century. The first documented instance occurred in Richmond, Wisconsin, in 1899, where a woman reported seeing a large kangaroo leaping around her backyard during a large storm. Interestingly, no kangaroos were reported missing from any nearby circuses, which were prevalent at the time, adding mystery to the sighting. That said, it is questionable whether a missing kangaroo would have been reported to the authorities, as there may have been consequences for releasing a kangaroo. Further, the police records of such a report may have been destroyed in the meantime. The United Kingdom has witnessed its share of mysterious marsupials as well. Documented colonies of red-necked wallabies exist, notably one that established itself in Staffordshire in the 1930s after escaping from a private zoo. Although the population peaked in the 1970s, Sightings have continued sporadically into the 21st century, including a rare albino wallaby in Northamptonshire in 2015. One of the more chilling accounts occurred in South Pittsburgh, Tennessee in 1934, where a kangaroo-like creature was witnessed killing and partially devouring several animals over a five-day period. Despite a search party tracking the creature to a cave, it was never found leaving no evidence of its existence aside from eyewitness accounts. I'm just going to go out on a limb and suggest that this probably wasn't a kangaroo. The 1970s brought a wave of sightings in the Midwest, particularly Illinois, Indiana, and Wisconsin, with multiple reports of kangaroos hopping at high speeds through fields and wooded areas. Despite extensive searches, none of these kangaroos were ever captured either physically or on camera. Phantom kangaroo sightings are not limited to rural areas. In 1974, two Chicago police officers were called to investigate a kangaroo standing on someone's porch. Although they located the animal, it eluded capture and continued to be sighted across Illinois and neighboring states. I suspect this was likely a kangaroo escaped from a private collection or perhaps a local circus. Sightings of phantom kangaroos continue on till the present day. My take on this one, all these sightings were viral marketing for the film Kangaroo Jack. The disappearance of Oscar Acosta. Oscar Zeta Acosta, a notable Mexican-American attorney, activist, and writer, vanished under mysterious circumstances in May 1974 while in Sinaloa in Mexico. His disappearance remains unresolved marked by an absence of concrete evidence and a body that has never been recovered. Acosta's life prior to this event was marked by a series of professional achievements and personal challenges. He transitioned from a military career to law, eventually passing the bar in 1966. His activism within the Chicano movement and legal representation of marginalized communities in East LA highlighted his commitment to his community. However, Acosta is best known for his complex relationship with Hunter S. Thompson. The two met in 1967 and quickly became entangled in professional and personal interactions 
that would influence Thompson's work, notably Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. Acosta criticized Thompson for misrepresenting his ethnicity, portraying him as Samoan rather than Mexican, and appropriating his experiences for literary gain. The theories surrounding Acosta's disappearance are varied, reflecting the turbulent life he led. His son, Marco Acosta, speculated that his father's confrontational nature could have led to a fatal altercation. In his last conversation with his son, Acosta advised Marco that he was going to board a boat full of white snow. I don't think I need to offer any additional commentary on that quote. I'll just leave it as it stands. Hunter S. Thompson explored several possibilities, including foul play by drug dealers or political adversaries, reflecting Acosta's contentious relationships and substance abuse issues. Others have speculated that Acosta may have died from an overdose while on the trip. Still others have theorized that he may have simply started a new life in Mexico. Oscar Acosta is presumed dead, but is still legally classified as missing. If he is alive today, he would be 89 years old. The death of Bugsy Siegel. Benjamin Bugsy Siegel was born to poor Eastern European Jewish immigrants in Brooklyn, New York in 1906. By his teens, he had launched a profitable protection racket and amassed a significant criminal record. Siegel, known for his violent streak, gained notoriety and the nickname Bugsy, which he detested. With connections like Al Capone and an alliance with Meyer Lansky, he became a leading hitman for the National Crime Syndicate. Despite successes, Siegel faced several assassination attempts and relocated to California, where he expanded into gambling, drugs, and paid companionship, mingling with Hollywood elites. Siegel is even reported to have met with Hermann Goring and high-ranking Nazis on a trip to Italy, a meeting which has been all but confirmed by historians. Needless to say, the high-ranking Nazis were likely not informed about Bugsy Siegel's Jewish background. In 1945, Siegel moved to Las Vegas to develop the Flamingo Hotel and Casino, marking the start of the luxury Vegas Strip. On June 20, 1947, an assassin shot Siegel through the window of his Beverly Hills home, striking him twice in the head, instantly killing him. His death remains quote-unquote unsolved till this day. Siegel's demise has been shrouded in mystery and speculation, with various theories circulating about the identity and motive of his assailant. The most prominent theory suggests that his death was a mob-sanctioned hit due to massive cost overruns and suspicions of embezzlement during the construction of the Flamingo Hotel. The theory posits that mob figures, possibly including close ally Meyer Lansky, ordered the hit due to Siegel's misuse of their funds. This narrative aligns with mob practices and the internal politics that governed organized crime. Others suggest that the killing may have been retribution for any one of the numerous killings associated with Siegel. Another theory is that he was killed by his girlfriend's brothers or her associates. Bugsy Siegel was dating Virginia Hill, an influential figure in the mob, and was rumored to be abusive towards her. Anyway, all that said, this is yet another case that I imagine will never be solved with any degree of certainty. 100 Man Killing Contest The 100 Man Killing Contest refers to an alleged competition between two Japanese officers, Toshiaki Mukai and Tsuyoshi Noda, during the Japanese invasion of China. This event was initially reported by the Tokyo Nichinichi Shimbun, capturing the brutality of the contest where the two men purportedly vied to eliminate 100 people using swords. The historical veracity and details of this event have been the subject of extensive debate and scrutiny. The contest came to significant public attention in Japan in the 1970s due to the investigative journalism of Katsuichi Honda, 
who published a series of articles based on interviews with Chinese survivors. His reporting rekindled interest in the Nanjing massacre and sparked fierce debate about Japan's wartime conduct and the nature of the reported killing contest. Critics and scholars have since debated the accuracy of the contest's portrayal, with some considering it a fabrication, while others consider it an exaggeration influenced by wartime propaganda and sensational journalism. The impact of this event on Japanese culture and media was profound. It highlighted the role of thrills and speed in wartime reporting, as Japanese reporters sought to cover the war in a manner that would captivate and horrify the home audience. This led to the creation of such kill count stories and other grotesque media spectacles that were part of the broader cultural transformation during total war. Following the war, the detailed accounts of the so-called 100 man killing contest were documented and became part of the evidence cataloged by the International Military Tribunal for the Far East. This was a significant development as the tribunal aimed to address the war crimes committed in the Asia Pacific region during World War II. In the aftermath of the war in the year 1947, the United States Army apprehended the two Japanese soldiers implicated in the contest, Toshiaki Mukai and Tsuyoshi Noda. They were subsequently held in custody at Sugamo Prison, a facility known for detaining war criminals. The subsequent legal proceedings saw Mukai and Noda extradited to China, where they faced charges in front of the Nanjing War Crimes Tribunal. This court was tasked with addressing the egregious violations of international law that occurred during the invasion and occupation of Nanjing. Alongside Mukai and Noda stood Gunkichi Tanaka, a captain in the Japanese army, who was accused of his own horrific acts. Tanaka's charges stemmed from his direct involvement in the massacre, during which he was responsible for the deaths of over 300 Chinese prisoners of war and civilians. The trial meticulously reviewed the evidence against the three men, tying them to the widespread atrocities committed during the Battle of Nanking and the horrific events that followed. The proceedings were marked by testimonies and documentary evidence that painted a clear picture of the scale and nature of the crimes. Naturally, given the circumstances in which the killings took place, evidence was lost and many eyewitnesses died in the intervening years. All three were found guilty of committing grave offenses against humanity and were sentenced to the ultimate penalty which was carried out swiftly. The sentences were carried out on January 28, 1948, in the Yuhuatai district, a location selected for the execution. The method chosen was shooting, a common practice for military executions. At the time of their execution, Mukai and Noda were both 35 years old, while Tanaka was slightly older, at 42. However, the veracity of this, quote, contest has been questioned, and it is now universally accepted that the contest did not happen, at least as indicated in the newspaper reports. While this killing contest is often portrayed now as being part of the Nanjing massacre, this contest took place en route to Nanjing. Further, according to the newspaper article, the two officers were engaging in this competition in the heat of battle, in hand-to-hand -hand combat. After the war, Noda admitted that he only killed four or five individuals with a sword in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Further, Noda admitted after the war, but before his trial, that he would convince opposing soldiers to surrender, and then when they were disarmed, behead them. At present, it's unlikely that the full scale of the men's actions will ever be known. But what's clear is that the story as commonly told is an exaggeration to make the men look like heroic soldiers rather than serial slayers empowered by their government. Anyway, whatever the truth of the matter is, it's clear that these two men engaged in atrocities and at the end of the day, face justice for their actions. The Nekamata.
The Nekomata is a feared cat yokai from Japanese folklore. The story may have its origins in a Chinese cat demon called the Sen Ri. The Sen Ri were noted to achieve great spiritual power in old age and achieve the power to shapeshift into a beautiful man or woman. But back to the Japanese context, which has developed independently from this potential Chinese seed. Nekamata are domestic cats, which have, quote, gone rogue by running away into the mountains in their old age and gaining additional powers while there. Further, when they become Nekomata, they gain a second tail, which apparently enhances their magical abilities. Nekomata are generally considered to be cats who were treated terribly by their owners. One account from the 18th century in Yamato Kaiki tells of a haunted house owned by a samurai, plagued by unexplainable disturbances. The source of the trouble was revealed to be the family's aged cat, which had transformed into an extremely destructive Nekomata. This tale, like many others, highlights the Nekomata's association with malevolent activities and their ability to bring about chaos. Nekomata are often confused with their more benevolent yokai counterparts, the Bakaneko, but they possess unique traits. While Bakaneko are mischievous and capable of shapeshifting, Nekomata are known for more sinister powers, such as necromancy, the ability to control the dead. This distinction makes the Nekomata particularly feared. Their malevolence is further illustrated by their ability to summon fires, a trait that has cemented their reputation as dangerous beings. Ancient folklore depicts these creatures as vengeful spirits, particularly targeting those who have wronged them. The older and more mistreated a cat is before its transformation, the more potent its powers as a Nekomata become. This has led to various superstitions, including the severing of cats' tails to prevent their transformation into these dreaded yokai. Cultural depictions of Nekomata vary, with Edo period illustrations often showing them in human forms, particularly as older women. These Nekomata are often playing the shamisen, a detail that carries an ironic twist considering that shamisen were traditionally made from cat skins. In modern times, the allure of Nekomata continues, transitioning from feared mythical beings to captivating characters in manga, anime, and other forms of pop culture. The takeaway from this one, treat your cats well, or they'll come back and burn down your house and reanimate your corpses to do evil acts. The Champawat Tiger. The Champawat Tiger, a notorious female Bengal tiger, is a chilling example of wildlife turning against humans, resulting in over 400 fatalities in early 20th century Nepal and India. This tiger began its spree by killing approximately 200 people in Nepal before being driven across the border into India, where it continued its rampage, adding another 234 victims to its toll. Colonel Jim Corbett, an Indian-born British hunter and colonial administrator, was called upon to stop this menace. Corbett was renowned in his day for his expertise in tracking and eliminating man-eating tigers. His quest led him to the Champawat region in 1907, where he eventually located and eliminated the tiger. It was believed that this particular tiger had resorted to hunting humans due to a combination of injuries and inability to hunt traditional prey. This aligned with Corbett's theory that stress of circumstances often leads tigers to become man-eaters. After this event, Jim Corbett became an advocate for conservation, significantly altering his views on wildlife and helping to establish India's first national park, now known as Jim Corbett National Park, doppelgangers. The concept of doppelgangers, or spirit doubles, has intrigued cultures around the world for millennia. Stemming from the German term meaning double walker, a doppelganger is often perceived as an apparition or duplicate of a living person. The doppelganger is traditionally regarded as a harbinger of some misfortune or even an omen of one's impending demise. This doppelganger lore has existed since the earliest recorded ancient Egyptian myth 
The ancient Egyptians believed in a ka, a tangible spirit possessing the same memories and feelings as its living counterpart. There is some evidence that ancient Egyptians believed that this spirit could exit the body and act independently on occasion. Similarly, Norse mythology introduces the Vardiger, a ghostly double scene performing a person's actions in advance. However, unlike the doppelganger, this is not necessarily seen as a malevolent creature or spirit. Historical figures like John Donne, Percy Shelley, and King Umberto of Italy reportedly encountered their own doubles under circumstances that were later linked to personal tragedies. However, upon research into these circumstances, there is a clear blending of the lines between legend and reality. For example, take into account the story of King Umberto's supposed encounter with his doppelganger. This tale has Umberto dining in a restaurant only to find out that the proprietor was his exact look-alike. Their conversation revealed astonishing similarities. Both were natives of the same town, shared the same birthday, and there had wives with identical names. Further, the restaurant had commenced business on the day Umberto was crowned. According to the story, Umberto learned of the restaurant owner's demise in a shooting on July 29, 1900. Guess what day Umberto was assassinated? July 29, 1900. If this tale was true, I suspect it would be extremely well documented. But it isn't well documented at all, and as such I strongly suspect it didn't happen. Possible paranormal explanations for the doppelganger have been suggested, with the two most common being a malevolent spirit or a shape-shifting being. Non-paranormal explanations indicate that some doppelganger sightings may be induced by psychological breakdowns or other more mundane explanations. Further, modern science has found the concept of twin strangers to be real, likely explaining many historical doppelganger accounts. Twin strangers are entirely unrelated people who look functionally identical. Human faces are vastly diverse due to evolutionary factors, with a specialized region in our brains dedicated to recognizing these differences. This diversity is not just a product of genetic variation, but also an evolutionary necessity for social interaction and identification. This same diversity, underpinned by a vast array of genetic combinations, makes the exact duplication of facial features between unrelated individuals highly improbable. However, our cognition isn't perfect, and people who appear close enough can appear to our brains to be perfect doppelgangers. Given all the potential explanations for doppelgangers, the phenomenon can definitely be classified as something real. Further, if you hold a cultural belief that seeing a doppelganger is a sign of misfortune, an innocuous twin strange event may lead to negative consequences. Lassiter's Reef, the lost outback mother load. Lassiter's Reef is a legendary gold mine from Australia. In 1929, Lassiter captivated the Australian public and media by asserting that he had found a vast gold deposit years earlier. The story drew significant attention, leading to several expeditions attempting to rediscover the fabled site. In 1930, an expedition was undertaken which would greatly enhance the reputation of the reef, but also end tragically for Lassiter. In 1930, Lassiter managed to secure around 50,000 pounds in private funding for an expedition to rediscover the reef. This journey was notable for its use of motor vehicles and an airplane, a rarity for the era. The team consisted of seasoned bushmen, prospectors, engineers, geologists, and a pilot. By 1930s standards, this was an absolute cutting edge operation, as one would expect with the amount of funding they received. The expedition embarked from Alice Springs on July 21st, 1930, with Lassiter proving to be an unreliable guide. Their destination was Il Bilba, a recently established airport near Lake Mackay. The journey was fraught with logistical and physical challenges, notably the loss of their airplane early in the trip. Upon arrival at Mount Leisler, 
located deep in the outback within the Northern Territory, Lassiter suddenly claimed they were 240 kilometers off target. Frustrated, the other members of the expedition accused Lassiter of fraud and terminated the expedition, leaving him to pursue his quest with just one other man, Paul Johns, and a team of camels. After a contentious period marked by erratic behavior, Lassiter claimed to have found the gold reef again, yet refused to disclose its location, leading to a fallout with Johns. Eventually, Johns also abandoned Lassiter, who then continued to wander into the desert alone with his camels on his quixotic quest. In March 1931, the Eclipse Gold Expedition found Lassiter's body, which had been buried in a shallow grave by the local Aboriginal people. According to Lassiter's diary, his camels had even recognized he was crazy and abandoned him. However, he was lucky and subsequently survived for a period with the assistance of a nomadic Aboriginal people before succumbing to malnutrition and exhaustion. This Aboriginal group attempted to help him, but according to the diary, it was too late and Lassiter was already blind, amongst other ailments. In the years following this expedition, Lassiter was generally regarded as being incorrect about his finding, even if interest in the mine continued. However, geological evaluations conducted in 2014 suggested the region might have potential for gold, thus reigniting interest in Lassiter's elusive gold reef. Modern adventurers and gold prospectors continue to be drawn to the mystery conducting their own quests based on Lassiter's descriptions and modern technological aids like Google Earth. Headless Men The myth of the headless men is deeply rooted in both Greek mythology and medieval belief. These beings, described as having their facial features on their chests instead of their heads, have intrigued people for millennia. Greek historian Herodotus, one of the earliest sources, described these creatures inhabiting remote parts of the world, particularly in Libya and Africa. Pliny the Elder, a Roman naturalist and philosopher, echoed these accounts, adding to the air of mystery and remoteness by locating them in the inaccessible regions of Ethiopia. Interestingly, these creatures also found their way into Christian sermons and medieval thought. This reflected the period's attempts to reconcile classical mythology with Christian doctrine. The mention of these creatures in a sermon, for instance, underscores the period's acceptance of such beings while wrestling with their theological implications. And I'm not joking here, there were three schools of thought on the headless men. The first is that they should be preached to and converted to Christianity. After all, was a head required for salvation? The second school of thought was more sinister, suggesting that the creatures were agents of Satan who must be exterminated. The final school of thought is that they were actually just animals that happened to resemble men who were headless, and as such they should just be left alone as a general rule. The fascination with headless men persisted into the Renaissance and beyond. Further, as the scope of European knowledge of the world expanded, the headless men were pushed to further and new corners of the world. No longer were they thought to reside in Libya, but rather they were thought to live in the far-flung reaches of Asia and the Americas. Sir John Mandeville's travels and Sir Walter Raleigh's reports of encountering similar creatures in South America introduced the headless men to new generations. The most common explanation for what the headless men were comes from the potential mistaken belief in ritualistic or warrior masks used by other cultures. Under this theory, the mask, used in a ceremonial context, would make it appear that the person had no head and instead had facial features on their stomach. Still others question whether the headless men represented people attempting to describe alien beings in a language which made sense to them in their context. The Mogollon Monster The Mogollon Monster, Arizona's answer to Bigfoot, is a hominid-type cryptid. 
described as over seven feet tall, with red eyes and a body covered in dark hair. The Mogollon monster is known for its foul odor, inhuman strides, and eerie screams. Like Bigfoot, it exhibits distinct behaviors like mimicking animal sounds, hurling stones, and decapitating prey. While some suggest it could be a distinct species adapted to Arizona's climate, skeptics argue sightings could be misidentified bears, a known local species. Despite similarities with Bigfoot, the Mogollon monster's unique traits and habitat fuel debates on its existence and classification. In my view, I agree with the bear misidentification hypothesis. But who am I kidding? I would love the Mogollon monster to be real. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell. Check out the Patreon, my YouTube membership, and the Discord. Links are in the description. Shout out to my patrons Noah Schubert, Kazak Cutie, Kurt the Squirt, Monoxide Wendigo, and Jeffer Metcalf. Also, big shout out to YouTube member Jordan All. Until next time, stay safe and healthy and peace out.